before before I get started, let me maybe say a little bit about my own um, sort of interest in and engagement with conceptual engineering. So for me, the popularity of conceptual engineering is very much a boon, um, not because I not just because I like conceptual engineering, but because for me, the label is a way of sort of um, bringing together lots of different issues that I have been interested in over the years, including things very much predating um, conceptual engineering. So my, um, my, my own dissertation, my earliest work was on the Lyer and Sorides paradoxes. I argued that those paradoxes arise because our language is inconsistent. And I did not bring up very much the kind of reform parts, but that's the kind of diagnosis of the Lyer and Sorides paradoxes that very much suggests a, um, um, that our language may need for some purposes to be reformed. Um, then another one of my main interests was um, um, meta-ontology and specifically the theme in meta-ontology that our concept existence, which is central to meta-ontological discussion, is just one concept of existence among others and with nothing, um, nothing specifically to sort of single it out as especially worthy of attention or anything like that. And again, there are clear connections to conceptual engineering. And then my work in metaethics, where the book that Manuel mentioned is a very um, central part, is about whether there are sort of in some sense alternatives and in some sense better alternatives to our thinnest, most basic normative concepts like the ones expressed by good and right and ought on their most general uses. So the, and the, all of this can be nicely sort of put under the heading of conception, conception engineering. Well, and I, at the same time, that does not mean that I'm thereby interested in or even feel a need to defend everything that's going on under, under the label conceptual engineering. And so part of what I find myself doing often when talking about conceptual engineering is trying to sort of um, separate the, my own interest in it and what underlies that from certain other kinds of projects and motivations that may be present under that very general label. And what I'm about to do today is sort of part of that. Um, and um, what I will, um, I will start by laying out the motivation as I see it. And I will talk about the sorts of questions that don't seem very pressing to me given that um, motivation, then focus on the questions that do seem more pressing to me given that motivation and eventually and for the most substantive chunk as I see it at the talk, I will focus on a particular one of those questions that do seem more pressing um, and more, well, maybe, maybe pressing or more, more theoretically significant given this kind of motivation. Okay, so after that long prelude, let's get started. So section one, so in their introduction to concept, the anthology, conceptual engineering, conceptual ethics, Herman Capel and David Plunkett quote Nietzsche's The Will to Power. And it's a passage by Nietzsche that's quoted by many. I myself like to quote it. Here it is. Philosophers, Nietzsche says, have trusted in concepts as completely as they've mistrusted the senses. They have not stopped to consider that concepts and words are, are inheritance from ages in which thinking was very modest and unclear. What dawns on philosophers last of all, they must no longer accept concepts as a gift, nor merely purify and polish them, but first make and create them, present them and make them convincing. Hitherto, one has generally trusted one's concepts as if they were a wonderful dowry from some sort of wonderland, but they are after all the inheritance from a most remote, most foolish, as well as most intelligent ancestors. What's needed above all is an absolute skepticism toward all inherited concepts. Okay, that's Nietzsche in sort of characteristic style. Um, here's um, Capellan and Plunkett um, paraphrasing the message from Nietzsche. They say Nietzsche here articulates a radical skepticism about all inherited concepts. Philosophers should question whether the concepts we have are good enough and should engage in conceptual critique. What emerges, thinks Nietzsche, is the following. We should, just, we should not just improve the concepts we've been given, reforming and or polish them in minor ways, but also create new ones, concepts not tainted by the most foolish of our ancestors. 
even if you think Nietzsche's claim is more than a bit hyperbolic, you might think some more moderate version of his view is justified. For example, maybe some of the concepts we have inherited are defective, or at least not as good as they could be for our current purposes. And I think that Nietzsche's advice, maybe mine is some hyperbole, and what Capellan and Plunk could say when commenting on the advice is right on the mark. Um, in general, there are lots of different possible concepts. The concepts that we do have are just some of all the possible concepts that are or might be, and it would be a miracle if they turned out to be the best ones for all relevant purposes. Minor thing, I say all relevant purposes, Capellan and Plunk could speak of our current purposes. I prefer to speak of all relevant purposes because our current purposes themselves may be bad ones in need of improvement. Our current purposes may be to sort of um, maintain the current unjust order or what have you. Okay. Um, and the way that I see things, this kind of thing is the chief motivation behind conceptual engineering, big space of possible concepts more or less a miracle if there couldn't be improvements. That is to say, if there weren't other concepts than the ones that we have and use for the purposes that we use concepts for, um, if there couldn't be others that are better for suited for the job than the actual ones are. So that's the sort of big picture motivation. Now in the literature of conceptual engineering, here are, um, a number of central questions. First, there's the question, what is meant by concept here? Where some alternatives are, well, there's the, there's Capellan's own austere picture of concepts where sort of there's, where we can equally well just talk about extensions and intentions. Um, then there are various more um, substantive or meaty, um, various more substantive or meaty conceptions of concepts where concepts are sort of associated with, cons with constitutive principles of various kinds and what have you. Um, um, that may be a sort of an important question for some purposes, what do we mean, mean by concept? But it's, um, um, it seems as if the, the general motivation for the conceptual engineering project stands regardless of what exactly we mean by concept, whether we mean the Capellanian um, extensions and intentions, or we mean something um, more substantive, it remains that there's a big vast space of possible concepts and the concepts that we do employ are only some among them. Um, another central question is, is it one of the same concept that changes or is the old concept replaced by a new one as we um, engineer a concept? Um, um, someone motivated by in the Nietzschean way that I described might say, well, um, who cares? The important thing is whether the, um, from trying to formulate myself as sort of neutral, whether the, whether the content associated with the concept after the change, however we should describe it, is a good one to employ and focus on and not. It's a matter um, it's just a matter of bookkeeping, whether we call it the same concept or not. Um, third, do we change the topic when revising or replacing the old concept? Big question in the literature, going back in some ways to Strawson's critique of Carnap. The idea is that someone who revises a concept or replaces a concept by a new one might in some um, pernicious way be changing the topic and so not address the original topic. If you're, drawn to all this by the Nietzschean motivation, you will think that, well, um, um, that does not seem like a pressing question because, because it may just be that even if we do change the topic, the old topic was just a bad one. The old topic was just something that sort of happened to come with us from our sort of um, from our ancestors or what have you. And um, it may be that we do, that there are other things that we do better by focusing on. Um, um, can the revisions be implemented and how is this best achieved? Question four on the list. This may sound like it, it is more um, like this is something that's highly relevant, even given this kind of Nietzschean motivation that I presented. You may think that, well, 
um, the Nietzschean emphasis on uh, it being a historical accident that we have the concepts that we do have and that there's a vast space of other possible concepts um, only becomes really relevant if it's um, possible for us to implement the revisions and actually come to use these other concepts. And I'm, well, I partly agree. I, I think that, um, 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 of course, it becomes all more important in a way that there are these other concepts to use if they're also available for us to use. But even assuming a negative answer to the question raised on the floor, even assuming that one can't revise or re replace concepts in the way that um, a conceptual engineer might want, investigation into what sorts of concepts that are and how good they are for various purposes is still relevant. And the following analogy is um, useful here. One may think that, well, it's it, given that you have a, a certain tool right now, it may be important to know just what the limitations of the tool are, even if the, um, um, even if um, it's practically impossible for you to um, um, come to use a better tool rather than the one that you're actually employing. Uh, five, should the old word be retained for the new concept? Then that may be an important question for various purposes. For example, you may think that, well, if you're, um, if you have certain practical purposes behind engaging in conceptual engineering, then it may be a question, well, is this um, change that we're trying to get in, get to come into effect more efficient if we use the old word or not. Um, but there's nothing immediately about the Nietzschean motivation which sort of forces that kind of question um, um, upon us. It's just about the concepts themselves and not about which word to use or which concept. Okay, so I'm, um, so I'm skeptical of how pressing any of the questions one through five are. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm skeptical as to how pressing those questions are given the motivation. Notice the limited point. This is not to say that questions one through five cannot be motivated. There may well be other reasons to be interested in them. Maybe other reasons to think that these are highly significant or pressing questions, but they're not questions, so, so to speak, about the um, motivated project as such or its um <clears throat> or its feasibility okay so then what sort of work does remain when it comes to the motivated project the Nietzschean the motivated project as such and its feasibility well pretty much everything regarding details of course which concepts are there actually and in which concepts are there concepts such that we do not have better ones for, for purposes at hand, for, for relevant purposes. <clears throat> so that's, but that's detailed work. The response as far as that work remaining is just, well, just do it. Stop talking about conceptual engineering and instead get around to actually figuring this out. Um, the question that I will wanna focus on talking about conceptual engineering is, well, what sort of, what sort of principled work and here are two clusters of questions, maybe more interesting questions out there, but here are two clusters that I will say something about. <coughs> Sorry. Um, first, briefly, on the prospects of conceptual innovation. Um, and then at some more length, um, what are the principled limits to what conceptual engineering is possible? Not not limits of the kind discussed when we talk about sort of the possibility of sort of implementation and getting people actually to use a particular concept that you want them to use, etc. But what sorts of more principled limits are there? And I will explain more when I get there what I have in mind when talking about these principled limits. First, briefly on the prospects of conceptual innovation. Um, David Chalmers, in a forthcoming paper, distinguishes between de novo engineering, as he calls it, and re-engineering. <coughs> Sorry. Um, de novo engineering is building a new bridge or concept or program or whatever 
Re-engineering, Chalmers says, is fixing or replacing an old bridge program concept or whatever. Chalmers applies this conceptual engineering. De novo conceptual engineering is building a new concept. And Chalmers reflects, and we're not going to read all of this, but reading part of it. Um, um, many or most of the standard examples in the recent conceptual engineering literature are cases of conceptual re-engineering. Certainly, the Carnapian explication literature is very much a literature on re-engineering. The conceptual engineering of belief has largely been re-engineering. There's also been re-engineering with the concept of truth. That's where Kevin Sharp's work comes in. More recently, there's been a lot of interest in re-engineering social concepts, such as the concept of woman and the concept of race. That's, for example, Haslinger's work. Many of the examples I, Chalmers, gave of conceptual engineering earlier in the article look more like de novo conceptual engineering. Take the cases of, and here are the examples that he used, epistemic injustice, supervenience, rigid designation, and indeed, conceptual engineering. These weren't particularly trying to fix or replace other concepts. Now, just a brief reminder, and I'm, the main thing that I'm talking about at this point is what are the prospects of conceptual innovation? I'll soon sort of re relate Chalmers, <coughs> Chalmers more, um, more explicitly to that. Um, um, it's true that one does not replace anything or try to replace anything when introducing talk of epistemic injustice, supervenience, etc. But are these really new concepts? Each of them can be given an explicit characterization in terms of old ones. Um, and so we have this kind of, well, at least, well, a question or challenge, um, which is, well, what Chalmers presents as introducing new concepts may just be introducing a more snappy label for a concept that we had already. And if so, these examples of conceptual innovation, conceptual novelty, examples that I take at Chalmers mean to be sort of good examples, sort of paradigmatic, compelling examples of this, aren't actually instances of conceptual innovation. So then the question is, well, what are the prospects of genuine conceptual innovation? If these aren't examples, what might be? Now, underlying what I've just said is a particular way of understanding talk of a new concept and of conceptual innovation. There are two different ways of understanding talk of having a concept, talk of acquiring a new concept. There will be more than two, but here are two that sort of stand out as especially salient. I'm sorry, I haven't had a problem with my voice all day and now suddenly I'm <coughs> sorry. Um, um, one, one has a concept C. Already if one has concept C1 through CN and grasps a mode of combination of concepts such that C1 through CN can be combined by M to have the same content as C. So I, even before I strung together the concepts or words to justify true belief, I had the concept because I had justified, I had true and I had belief and I could string them together. Secondly, one has a concept C only if C's content is readily available for employment. <clears throat> That's a different kind of criterion. Because here, it could be in principle that I have justified, I have true, and I have belief. But it would never occur to me to sort of put them together and think about them in the same breath or the same thought, as it were. And if so, then given to, I don't yet have justified true belief until someone shows me, hey, you can put these things together and think about them together. Now, Given one, the more liberal criterion for having a concept of the two ones, and I'm not going to attempt to sort of make it make a sort of definite choice between one and two. Given one, the more liberal criterion for having a concept, acquiring a new concept becomes more demanding. New concepts are more rare if we understood if we understand this along the lines of one, and actual search for more concepts for new concepts is more rare. If if two is only what's at issue, then I mean, we arguably do that all the time. Very often when we sort of put, put ideas together, we're in effect um, 
cobbling together new concepts. And that's arguably what was done when people started talking about epistemic injustice and things. But insofar as epistemic injustice can be given an explicit characterization in terms of concepts you already had, that was not a new concept in the sense of one. And given one, it is unclear how much conceptual engineering involves new concepts. Okay, and, I'm ha and I haven't said that we should, that we need to or should employ one instead of two, but the motivation presented, the Nietzsche motivation, the space of concepts, our concepts are the sum among all the concepts that are does, well, I say involve the search for concepts on the hand, I should say sort of motivates the search for concepts that are new in the sense of one. Shouldn't there be more, um, um, shouldn't there be more um, sort of um, concepts out there than the ones that we can string together using the concepts that we have and the, and the modes of combination of concepts that we have. So that, I'm, I'm gonna leave that for now. I had another talk last week where some of you were in attendance where I talked more about issues in this vicinity. I just wanted to flag this as sort of, well, here's one big issue that arises given this motivation. Now I'm gonna turn to the other um, big issue, the one about there being, to remind you, what are the principal limits? What kinds of concepts are there? What kinds of revisions of the concepts one finds oneself with are possible? And I'm mostly going to focus on number two here. What kinds of revisions are possible? And as you will see, what I will be focusing on is different from the implementation challenge, which has, which has to do with sort of given that you've made a decision, how can you bring yourself and others to actually sort of comply with that decision or recommendation? Um, what I will be talking about is best introduced as follows. Um, in one of the last chapters in his 2018 book, um, um, Herman Kaplan, um, in the book Fixing Language, Herman Kaplan says, are there terms so basic that they cannot be engineered? Are there terms so fundamental that we're stuck with them? So basic that evolution, revision, and amelioration are impossible. You could argue for such views in various ways, one line of thought has it that as a matter of empirical fact, there are certain meanings that we're born with and just can't get rid of. They're stuck in our brains and however much we try, they remain there. Blah, blah, blah. My, my conclusion will be that we should stick with the working hypothesis that everything is in flux, that all representational devices can be revised and there's no natural endpoint to conceptual engineering. So this is, I may have some issues with the way that Kaplan brings this up, but in principle, the idea is that sort of, well, might there be certain limits that are not merely sort of practical and having to do with sort of implementation, but are there in some sense more principled limits? And the way that he, Kaplan then goes on to discuss this possibility is that he discusses some work by David Chalmers and some work by me. And he thinks that, well, these are not examples of the kinds of principle limits that I'm uh, that would be at issue, and I I agree with Kaplan's conclusions, but I think that well, so to speak, I, I agree with his conclusions about Chalmers and my earlier work, but I think that he's sort of looking in the wrong place for principle lim for, for principle limits of the kind at issue, and um, I will turn to how a how might one might in a more reasonable way go on to look for limits of the kind of issue. Okay. So first, just as a kind of background, Kaplan's discussion of earlier Chalmers and earlier me. First Chalmers, um, David Chalmers in his 2011 paper, Verbal Disputes, um, mentions a strategy for deciding whether a given dispute is between some theorists is merely verbal. The strategy involves stating the dispute with a key term replaced by other terms and see if the dispute remains. If the dispute goes away, if the, the theorists are just sort of happy and, um, and in agreement when, when we've um, done this and it was verbal, if the dispute somehow sort of remains, the dispute wasn't verbal. So the idea is that, well, 
if you and I have a, have a dispute over what counts as um, a semantics, is such and such really semantics or not? Then if one can merely replace semantics by sort of saying sort of semantics one for my sense of semantics, semantics two for your sense of semantics, and we're both perfectly happy with all the statements made in the new terminology and we think, yeah, that, that captures everything and we're in agreement about that, then the dispute was verbal. Now, Chalmers notes an apparent limitation of sorts. In some cases, it seems that the dispute cannot be faithfully restated without the use of the key term. You see, let me start by reading Chalmers. I don't think it's super helpful, but I'll sort of, it'll give you the basic idea and then I'll try to sort of paraphrase the basic idea. He says, um, um, we can bar ought and introduce ought one and ought two, which are stipulated to apply to acts with the deontological and the consequence property respectively. Is there a residual disagreement now? Or, or did the disagreement sort of disappear in, in the same way that we imagined that it did in the case of physicalism? As we proceed, the disagreement gets harder and harder to state. It is plausible that once all moral terms are gone, no disagreement can be stated. We might agree on all the non-moral properties of the relevant actions, but still disagree on whether it's right. In the case of semantics and physicalism and so on, the situation suggested a verbal dispute. Should we likewise diagnose a verbal dispute here? Intuitively, the answer is no. For all that we've said, moral disputes are substantive disputes. Instead, we have simply exhausted the relevant vocabulary. It appears at a, at a certain point, perhaps once we have fixed on the appropriate moral ought, we have reached bedrock. A substantive dispute involving a concept so basic that there's no hope of clarifying the dispute in more basic terms. Okay, so, Again, um, we might sort of go into how Chalmers puts things. I think have some issues with the way that he puts things, but the basic idea I think is clear and um, compelling. The idea is that, well, in, the, in some cases of philosophical disputes, like when we have a dispute over what's semantics or what's physicalism, it's plausible that one can, so to speak, get rid of the dispute just by introducing new terms. Semantics one, semantics two, physicalism one, physicalism two. And, Insofar as we can do so, the dispute was verbal. So it's part and parcel of this way of looking at things that many disputes actually are verbal. But in some cases, it seems implausible that that could be what's going on. If you and I have different views on what ought to be done and someone, said, and someone then says, to us, well, stop it, stop it, stop it. Let's just use ought sub one for Mati's deontological ought and let's just use ought sub two for Mati's opponents, consequentialist thoughts. And then you can just happily sort of agree on what's true, <laughs> given, those, um, um, given those labels. Um, aren't you happy then? And intuitively, no, we're not happy then because we're not, we don't just care about what ought to be done deontologically speaking or what ought to be done consequentialistically speaking. We wanna know what ought to be done. <laughs> Similarly, if we have a dispute over what's over truth. And we wonder sort of, well, are they sort of, well, we ask what is truth and someone su suggests, well, maybe let's just tr use truth sub one for Massey's notion. Let's just use truth sub two for Manuel's notion. And then um, sort of, I think that there's like a residual sense that, well, okay, even if we know what's, um, what's truth sub one and what's truth sub two, well, we will still wonder well, what's true and so on and so forth. So there's, I think, certainly a phenomenon there. And, the, um, and the, what's going on is this, that if E is a bedrock expression and the way that I've just sort of tried to impress upon you that ought in one of its uses or true might be a bedrock expression, then one cannot eliminate the expression without a sense of loss. One cannot, intuitively speaking, faithfully state what was at issue in theses involving E when E is not used. So I can state sort of what's, what deontologically ought to be done or what consequentialistically ought to be done, but without the use of the bare ought, I can't recover the, um, what the dispute actually was about. So I think that there's, so the Chalmers phenomenon as we might call it is real, but, to me, it does not seem to sort of address this question of the principled limits of conception engineering that Capellan used 
the Chalmers thing to illustrate because even if one cannot eliminate the expression without a sense of loss, it can be that even so, E should be eliminated or revised. The loss in question may be a loss that we can and should live with. That's a separate issue from whether there is a sense of loss and nothing that Chalmers says actually addresses that kind of thing. Also, and this further indicates that there's something amiss here, Chalmers very explicitly is only talking about replacing one expression by another. It's a diagnosis of verbal dispute. So first, you and I are using two expressions, physicalism. And then he says, well, how about Mati, if you use instead the expression physicalism one for what you have in mind and you, Mati's opponent, why don't you just use the expression physicalism too for what it is that you want to, want to talk about. That's just replacing one expression by another and it's built into this as kind of strategy for diagnosing what the dispute is verbal, that the old and the new expression stand for the same thing. But that means that we're not talking about replacing concepts in any interesting way at all. So that's another reason why um, um, Chalmers, at least as presented, seems to be beside the point. And I'll be more brief about earlier me. Um, so in a 2015 paper, I argued um, roughly, I'm gonna be quick about this because the details sort of, I mean, I think the details are in, in and of themselves interesting, but the details don't matter at all to the point that I wanna make here and now. Um, my claim there was that some concepts and my examples were true and exists and ought are conceptual fixed points in the sense that in each case, they are the only possible candidates for playing a certain role. So in the case of, um, in the case of true, the idea is that, well, if we try to imagine a community that seeks to assert something when it has property P instead of being true, and so are using P instead of true as their truth concept, then we will, we will fail. That's not, that's not what we're in effect um, um, envisaging. What we're, um, what's going on is rather that the community has views on different contents than the ones that we have views on. Again, I'm being very, I'm being super quick about this. If someone wants the details, it's just sort of deal with that in the um, Q and A. But the idea is that there's a role such as being the norm of assertion. And the idea is that, well, we can't imagine a community that uses another concept as their norm of assertion. They just assert different things from us and that's a different matter. Um, this kind of argument, if it succeeds, means that, well, the, the concept true is the only candidate for playing a certain role, namely the role of being the norm of assertion. And that kind of argument, which Incidentally, I don't even think that the argument works anymore, but that's, that's also a separate issue. That kind of argument, that sort of claim may be significant, but even if the claim is correct, one can respond, maybe one doesn't need any concept playing the role in question. Maybe we should not sort of um, have a speech check of assertion to begin with, or should not have a speech check of assertion that's governed by some sort of norm of, uh, norm of correctness, nothing that I argued, whether I argued correctly or not, sort of speaks at all to that sort of bigger question. And so um, if we think bigger, I'm not actually, I was not actually arguing unconditionally for there being um, limits, principle limits to the revisions of concept because one can still, for all that I argue, one can avoid having a concept any concept that plays the role in question, in this case, the role of being a normal position. Okay, so, so, I, so I started this sort of this part of the um, talk by um, bringing up um, sort of Capellan's general talk of might there be some sort of principle limits to conceptual engineering. Um, and he, he, does, he wants to say no, he discussed this matter and motivated no answer by discussing and criticizing what David Chalmers and I in different texts had um, argued. And I think that, well, 
again, to sort of repeat the um, conclusions um, that I just say that I think that well, what Chalmers and I did aren't even sort of, these things aren't even directly relevant to the general question that it seemed that Capellan wanted to raise. So discussing us and our shortcomings isn't a good way to sort of um, um, approach that question. Now, is there a better way to approach this kind of principle limits question? And I think there may be, and I think we may take our cue from um, some of Thomas Hoffweber's recent work. Most of this work is unpublished. Um, there's, um, um, there's one paper that's um, published or forthcoming in philosophical perspectives. It's in the bibliography, it's on logical concepts, but the more general work is I think still um, unpublished. So um, Hoff Weber introduces the notion of an inescapable concept. He thinks that, well, even if all concepts that one has in some sense can be revised, and revision hearing is used broadly, such as to sort of involve and include what others might call replacement, maybe some cannot be rationally revised, and inescapability goes with rational revisability. Maybe for whichever concept you have, I might through sort of brain surgery or whatever cause you not to have that concept anymore or cause you to have a different concept. But that's not a rational process. The question is whether, so to speak, you can have, whether there are concepts that you have such that given that you have them, you cannot rationally decide to have another concept instead. That's the idea behind in, inescapability. And inescapability, as Hot Weber talks about it, is, um, is very clearly and explicitly a kind of a relative notion. Contrast the notion of an inevitable concept. That's a concept that a thinker cannot, or better, cannot rationally fail to have. One might believe in inescapable concepts, but not inevitable ones. It may be that if I start out with a classical logical concept, concepts, they are inescapable for me. I cannot rationally revise them. But you may equally be born with or come to have the intuitionistic logical concepts. And then those might be inescapable for you. You cannot rationally revise the concepts that you have. And if so, then I have a certain set of inescapable concepts. You have a different sense of a set of inescapable concepts. No, none of these concepts is inevitable because, well, we have different inescapable concepts. Now, one wrinkle when it comes to the initial characterization of inescapability is that, well, may think that, well, aren't all concepts in principle rationally revisable? Because, well, um, um, imagine someone saying to you, I will torture you unless you revise concept C. And then you may think, oh, well, I guess it's rational for me to revise concept C if that's what you're going to do to me otherwise. So there's a sense in which that kind of scenario might put pressure on the very idea of inescapability, but this seems intuitively like a kind of, well, irrelevant complication. Um, a new formulation, this is um, Hoffeber's way of dealing with this kind of problem, is to speak of, well, is the concept worth in and of itself to be kept or to be re re replaced, revised? Is, it, is there something about the concept in and of itself that makes it rationally revisable or not, independently of independent motivations, such as your fear of torture? And Hoffweber also adds the writer for the purposes of inquiry. So that's the um, general idea of inescapability. And um, and before I go on, um, let me relate back to um, how I started this part of the talk. So I mentioned sort of Herman Capellan fixing language, talking about, well, might there be certain sort of concepts so basic or so fundamental that it just cannot be revised, et cetera. And, um, and I said that, well, his discussions of Chalmers and of me are kind of irrelevant, but if there are good examples of concepts that are inescapable in half bearer sense, that seems to be an issue of, um, 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 that seems to be an example of what's at issue in Capellan's discussion. 
if I find that a given concept of mine is inescapable, then we have problems even before we get to a kind of implementation challenge. Then we get to, well, it's just not rational for me to um, replace this concept to begin with, whether or not um, by adjusting my use in relevant ways I can or, or what have you. Okay, so my, but that's on the assumption that there are inescapable concepts. Um, um, what might be some examples? And um, Hoffaber gives a number of different examples. I want to focus on two examples that both seem to me to be um, simpler than other ones and seem to me to be sort of more potentially promising than other ones. Whatever in the end we should say about them. And I have, I have concerns. But um, first example um, um, that Hoffaber uses is a lot of logical concepts. Suppose that I come to my this kind of question of which concept to use already having classical negation that's my concept of negation that's what i'm that's what i use then i can for example prove to myself using these um, um using these um, concepts that i have that double negation elimination is valid it's classically valid um, if I then go on to decide to replace classical by intuitionistic negation, then Hoffaber says I lose a valid form of inference. I used to be able to reason validly from not not B to B. Now I can't anymore. I lost something. That's bad. The um, switch, if I were to contemplate it from classical to intuitionistic negation, is an irrational switch. And of course, that's just one example of sort of um, reasoning about classical negation, but he thinks that the, the relevant reasoning regarding classical negation generalizes in such a way that once I have classical negation, I can justify it to myself in such a way that it will never be rationally revisable. A second example that Hoffaber uses um, is explicitly with inspiration from what I talked about in my book, Choosing Normative Concepts, um, um, but I did not there use the example for this kind of purpose. Um, Hoffaber says, suppose I have the concept ought, the con the more specifically sort of ought simplicity or all things considered ought. Um, then even if among, in, somewhere in the space of concepts, there's a possible counterpart ought star associated somehow with the same normative role being sort of of use for the same action guiding purposes, but with a different extension. So what I ought to do is not the same as what I ought start to do. I can conclude using my concept that I come to the issue with that it's ought that I ought to use. I can think to myself, hmm, if I were to do what I ought to start to do, well, then I wouldn't do what I ought to do, and that's bad. That's how I reason, given that it's ought, that's my concept for assessing these sorts of things. If I were to start out with ought star, then I could, then I could reason analogously in favor of ought star, that, oh, well, even if there's this other concept ought out there, well, if I were to use that, then I wouldn't do what I ought to start to do. And that's a bad thing, a bad star thing, perhaps. Um, um, so that's the second example of um, inescapable concepts. Now, there are, so, so half everything is these are compelling examples of inescapable concepts. Logical concepts, basic logical concepts are inescapable basic normative concepts like ought are similarly inescapable and i've given briefly the reasoning now in principle i could go on for quite some time talking about well all sorts of different questions about these purported examples of inescapable concepts um the only thing that i will do before i wrap up will be to go through one kind of complication that i think is there and what to say in light of that complication um but um before I um, before I do so, let me just sort of say something about the sort of the map. Um, so assume for the moment that Hoff Weber is right that there are these concepts that are inescapable for think the thinkers who already have them, and among them are logical and normative concepts. Then 
That, of course, does not spell doom for conceptual engineering as I introduced and motivated it by appeal to Nietzsche. It just means that there are limits. Um, I can still sort of revise and engineer all sorts of other concepts. All that it's all that this kind of um, uh, conclusion would yield is that, well, there are specific cases where it wouldn't be rational for me to um, embark on an engineering project. But in but but figuring out what those limits to conceptual engineering are, what those concepts are such that once you have them, you can't rationally revise them, that still seems to be an important sort of principled task regarding understanding um, conceptual engineering. Okay. And again, there's lots, lots to say, possibly lots to criticize regarding um, these examples of purportedly inescapable concepts, but I'm just going to focus on one kind of complication. And it's one that's sort of, in a way, it's similar to what I brought up already in connection with um, earlier me before. It seems that one must relativize the purposes. Hofweber just talks about whether something is inescapable full stop or not. Focus on the logic case. If my main aim in reasoning is to reason validly, not to happen to go from true premises to false conclusions, then concluding the double negation elimination is valid could, I mean, again, I'm bracketing potential other concerns, but could reasonably be thought to settle the matter in favor of employing, of continuing to employ classical negation. But there are other epistemic aims that I might have. If my main aim is, for example, just to believe loads of truths, a great, I want to believe many truths and have a good ratio of truths over falsehoods, then other concepts governed by other rules, not necessarily truth preserving ones, may be better ones to use. Sometimes the different epistemic aims may mean conflict, like when I try to ask the general, what all things considered ought I to believe? But at least sometimes the aim simply varies with context. Sometimes I'm, in, I'm engaged in deductive reasoning. Sometimes I'm engaged in different kinds of reasoning. A similar point holds for ought. Um, so I mentioned, albeit briefly before, that the ought that I was concerned with was the um, um, all things considered ought. Um, let me just now do what I maybe should have done before to do that I just pause on what this means. And here's a way of introducing the notion of an all things considered art. So suppose that um, you have deliberated about what's the morally right thing to do. Morally, you ought to do this, that, or the other. You ought to sort of, um, give away your fortune and not steal or what have you. Um, then you arrive at that conclusion. I know that's what I morally ought to do. Then comes your next thought. Oh, well, what, what ought I prudentially to do? Well, prudentially, I should keep my fortune. I should steal still more so I get a bigger fortune because that will give me a good life. And once you've concluded this is what I morally ought to do, this other thing is what I prudentially ought to do, then it seems that there's a question left for you to answer. Namely, in light of these considerations, what ought I to do? And morally good people will, of course, think that well, what you ought to do, simpliciter, is what you morally ought to do. But the point is just there is a further question there. It's at least, so to speak, um, conceptually possible to think I am morally ought to do this. But this other more fun thing is what I genuinely ought to do. So that's the all things considered ought. And a um, subsidiary aim of bringing this out is that, well, this illustrates that, well, the um, notion of ought has different uses. There are sort of different ought concepts or however you want to put it. Um, sometimes my focus in deliberation may not be on what I all things considered ought to do. Sometimes my focus may simply be on morality or sometimes my focus may just be on prudence. And even given the kind of argument you, 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 about sort of ought and ought star um, earlier, um, one can significantly ask, significantly and non-trivially ask whether to use all things considered ought or all things considered ought star, meaning what ought, which one of these oughts to do from the point of view of morality or from the point of view of prudence or 
what have you. So there are, in both of the cases that are these best kinds of cases for inescapability, there is relativization to purposes. And I think this is not so far even a kind of criticism of Hopper, but just kind of obvious points that, well, when I ask, is this and this um, sort of in, in, inescapable? Is this something that I need to use? The use is always for some aim or purpose or other, and the different use of a concept may be with different aims or purposes in mind. This relativization affects how we should think about inescapability. If there's, um, if we must relativize the purposes, we must also relativize the purposes somehow when we characterize what it is for a concept to be inescapable. Um, and here's a possible suggestion, possible simple suggestion of concept is inescapable for a thinker if it's inescapable for some purpose that she has. Go. Um, the problem, though, is that this seems very weak, and this seems to be compatible, and a concept being inescapable in this sense seems to be compatible with it being inescapable for some purpose that it's very easy to get rid of. Compare the point earlier made in connection with my earlier self that, well, even if the notion of truth is somehow inescapable for maintaining the practice of assertion, it could still be that, well, maybe the practice of assertion is, well, I was gonna say a crap practice, but even if it's not a crap practice, it could still be one with better counterparts. Um, moreover, um, um, to illustrate the weakness of this, for each, each concept C that a thinker has may be inescapable for the specific purpose of thinking C thoughts or concluding C truths. <laughs> and then we get inescapability very, um, um, very quickly. So you may speak of, you may introduce here the notion of a defective or non-defective purpose, or a kind of, or a kind of, or for that matter, of an ideal versus non-ideal purpose. And then one can introduce suggestions like the following: a concept is inescapable if it's inescapable for some non-defective purpose, or if you like, some for some ideal purpose. Um, a purpose that cannot itself be improved. Um, a concept is absolutely inescapable if it's inescapable for an inescapable non-defective purpose that one has. Now we use the notion of inescapability also to characterize purposes. And a purpose is inescapable if one cannot rationally revise or replace that purpose. And that leads us with the question, might some purposes be inescapable such that one cannot rationally replace that purpose with another? And um, that's where the handout ends. Um, I um, um, don't know, I have this sort of brief remark there that I'm not even gonna um, um, read. You can read it yourselves if you're, interested let me just close by and the reason why i don't have anything more to say is but while i have some thoughts about inescapability of purposes they're sort of loose and speculative enough that putting them on a handout makes them seem more sort of um, serious than these points are <laughs> um so let me just um 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 um, um throw out some things to end with um, so one um and they're sort of their independent suggestions as well. So first of the independent suggestions, um, Alan Gibbard, writing about ought, writing about ethics, speaks about the last ought before action. And he thinks that, well, whenever you deliberate with a deliberation ending up in an action, one can sort of put your sort of the conclusion of your deliberation in terms of, well, I ought to do this. And the ought, he says, that he is interested in is this last ought before action. He thinks that somehow that's, in some sense, something that you employ when rationally deliberating about how to act. And you, you may think that, well, that the purpose of having a last ought before action is an inescapable purpose, if anything is. You find yourself with this mode of deliberation. The only way to get rid of it is to sort of give it up in favor of just plumping for one thing over another, and that does not seem rational. So that's a specific example of something that might be an inescapable purpose. Second speculative suggestion, um, what about um, um, 
people sometimes emphasize how different basic belief forming methods different are sort of um, speak of basic belief forming methods such as sort of um, forming beliefs by deduction or by induction or by using in intuition or by using observation. And those basic belief forming methods are justified by their um, sort of um, working. You can sort of, you can in you know, a sort of non-circular way justify your relying upon this method, but it's only by um, sort of employing it and finding it, finding that it works, that it's justified. And insofar as there are specific concepts that are, so to speak, implicated in the use of one of these basic belief forming methods, you may think that, well, the purpose of um, um, that purpose, the purpose of using the concept for um, in this method for belief formation might be an inescapable one. You're sort of, you're, you're, that's one of your basic methods for coming to believe something. And given that, the, given that there's nothing more basic that you can rely upon in order to justify this basic belief forming method, you are in a way stuck with it and you can't, and there's no sort of external vantage point from which to criticize it. Third speculation, last one. So I earlier quoted from um, Capellan and Plunkett's introduction to conceptual engineering and conceptual ethics. Um, um, in one of the contributions to that um, um, collection is Joshua Devers, um, um, scouting report from the outer limits of conceptual engineering, um, which not only has a wonderful title, but it's also a wonderful paper. And one thing that Deborah there says is that, well, look, conceptual engineers are concerned with trying to sort of choose between different concepts to employ. But that's the wrong sort of approach. We should, um, um, as inquirers, we should sort of collect and amass all truths. So we should employ all concepts. That's the sort of ultimate goal. He calls this um, um, conceptual maximalism. And if you are a conceptual maximalist, then you have rational reason to think, see thoughts, and conclude see truths, no matter what see may be, because, well, they will be among the sorts of things that you should sort of amass in your, in your overall theory of the world. So on a Dever-like um, approach, you may think that, um, well, there are all sorts of purposes that are inescapable in the sense of rationally un not revisable, sort of there, sort of you should, for each concept C, you should think, see thoughts and conclude sea treats. So as I said, this last bit here about what might actually be an inescapable purpose was uh, speculative. Let me end now by just sort of trying to summarize what I did. So I started by laying out the motivations for conceptual engineering as I see it. Then I said that, well, some, some questions that are central in the current literature on conceptual engineering, whether or not they can be motivated in other ways, don't seem to be immediately motivated by this kind of motivation. And then I sort of asked, well, what sorts of principal questions might be actualized by taking the motivation for conceptual engineering that I gave seriously? And then I first briefly discussed this issue of sort of conceptual novelty, conceptual innovation, that was by appeal to Chalmers's recent stuff on conceptual engineering, de novo conceptual engineering. Then I turned to what I think of as the main part of the talk, where I talk about, well, might there be some sorts of um, principled theoretical limits to conceptual engineering as distinct from sort of implementation limits? And there I talked about, I introduced that by talking about Capellan's fixing language and this discussion there of um, Chalmers and my earlier self. And then towards the end, I've talked about Hoffweber's notion of inescapability in this, um, in this context. And that's it. Thank you for um, listening.